What is the one thing necessary for Christians to do? This is the Deep Questions Podcast, and I'm your host, Chase Thompson, a pastor and writer in Salinas, California. Now, if you want to get in touch with me with a question for the show or a comment, I want to invite you to go to our website, which is Deep questionspod.com. That's deepquestionspod.com. Hit the contact form there. I especially love to hear from critics and atheists and skeptics, even the snarky ones, because you know what? I love you guys. I love critics, skeptics, and atheists. You can also find me on social media if you want to look me up there, Chase A. Thompson on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. As I've mentioned the last couple of episodes, the church that I pastor, which is Valley Baptist Church in Salinas, California, We're hosting a Reasons to Believe weekend coming up June 24th through 26th with Dr. Mike Lacona. He is the author of several books on the resurrection of Jesus and an ardent debater of atheists, agnostics, and skeptics on YouTube and in colleges and in universities. He just recently finished a seven-hour debate with Dr. Bart Ehrman. So if you want to come to our conference with Dr. Lacona, all I'm going to do is ask you to contact me through our website, and I will send you a free code so that you can come and attend the whole conference for absolutely free. Just go to Deep questionspod.com and you can contact me for a free code and I will give you the link to sign up for the conference. Well, we've got some good episodes on the podcast coming up for you. I have interviewed Dr. Mike Lacona today, earlier And that episode should be out in the next few days after I edit it. It was a fantastic time with him. I really loved him, loved what he had to say, loved his attitude, lots and lots of fun. I also expect part two of our episode on guns and Christians to be out in the next, I don't know, couple of weeks or so. We'll see. I do want to thank you for listening and ask for you to leave a review of the show if you enjoy it on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. If you can leave a review there, that would be awesome. Awesome. We have lots of new listeners to the show over the past couple of weeks, including listeners from Buenos Aires, Argentina, Teresina, Brazil, Luanda, Angola, Al Cahira, Egypt, parts unknown Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Tanzania, Punjab, Pakistan, Kerala, India, Albay, and Lanao de Nort. Philippines, Bali, Indonesia, Queensland, Australia, Auckland, New Zealand, Warsaw, Poland, Zurich, Switzerland, Stockholm, and Vastragorland, Sweden, Helsinki, Finland, Utrecht, Netherlands, Northern Ireland, UK, St. Paul, Minnesota, Albany, New York, Lonnieburg, California, Jacksonville, Florida, Charlotte, North Carolina, York, Pennsylvania, Savannah, Georgia, Sweetwater, Texas, Eugene, Oregon, Mark. Pet, Michigan, and Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Who? That was a mouthful. We haven't done that in a while. Thanks you all for listening, and thanks for telling a friend. Well, according to Jesus, what is the one thing that is necessary? Now, I guess that's a pretty open-ended question, but we're going to take a look at an unsung hero in the Bible that is one of my all-time favorite people, a uh, young lady named Mary of Bethany, and I am really excited to talk about her. She's one of my heroes. Often people criticize the Bible as somewhat backwards in its relations to women. In truth, however, it is amazing how many female heroines are praised in the Bible. Mary of Bethany, Mary Magdalene, the Syrophoenician woman, Hannah, Jael, Deborah, the women who traveled with Jesus and took care of them, the first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus, Chloe, Junia, Phoebe, who were leaders in the New Testament church. Look, in terms of ancient literature, the Bible is like the least backwards-looking book you can find. Well, I'd like to begin with a diagnostic illustration that Brian Chappelle uses in his excellent book, Holiness by Grace. He tells a story and asks us to find ourselves in that story. And here it goes. She took her children to the park to break the monotony of the summer days, and instead she ended up breaking her own heart. She watched her children run to the playground as another car drove into the parking lot. The car ground to a quick stop, and a young, vibrant woman with a beaming smile leaped out of the driver's seat and virtually skipped to a secluded table near an adjoining lake. The imagination of the mother began to race. Who could this young woman be meeting in such a secluded spot with so much enthusiasm? Was this a long-awaited and carefully planned rendezvous with her over-busy husband? Was it a lunch date with a best friend? 
Or was it a tryst between secret lovers? Well, the young mother determined to stay on the lookout for whoever got out of the next car. But no one came immediately, and the mother soon grew busy watching her children, breaking up fights, cleaning up skin knees, and that sort of thing. When she finally did glance up again at the secluded woman, what the woman saw made her heart skip a beat. The woman was reading a Bible and praying. The person she had leapt from the car to meet with such enthusiasm was her Lord. The young mother recognized with pain that penetrated her spirit that she no longer had that same kind of enthusiasm. Once, the excitement of her own relationship with God had overwhelmed her. Once, the joy of her salvation had burned warm and bright. But now that earlier fervor was gone. Faith had become kind of dreary. God had become kind of detached and a frowning bystander. Something had happened over her years of her walk with the Lord. She didn't know exactly what it was, but she did know that she would not now skip to meet with him. She had lost something wonderful, and she wept there in the park for her loss. Do you find yourself in that story? Well, as we read about Mary of Bethany, it's worth reflecting on where you might be in that story, the story of Mary and Bethany and Martha. Are you like Martha in that you're kind of serving, but you're also a little angry about it? Are you like the disciples in that story, following the truth and following Jesus, but you're angry about any sort of impression that somebody might, that might love him more than you do? Are you outside of a relationship with Jesus right now, totally, and wondering what's all the fuss about over him? Well, if you don't know who Mary of Bethany is, then I am privileged to tell you about her. She was a friend of Jesus, most importantly. She was a sister of Martha. Martha really liked to serve, and she was also, Mary of Bethany, the sister of a guy named Lazarus, who I'm sure you've heard of, the guy that Jesus raised from the dead. Mary of Bethany lived in a small village called Bethany, right, which was located on the eastern slopes of the Mount of Olives, very close to Jerusalem. We don't know how Jesus and this family met, but we can tell by his multiple visits with them, including, including a visit that took place just years before his death, that Jesus viewed Mary, Martha, and Lazarus as very, very close friends. Today, we are going to look at two episodes in the life of Mary of Bethany, and they both are going to help us understand today's deep question, which, to remind you, which is the, what is the one thing that Jesus says is necessary? We humans are finite in mortal creatures. Well, at least in the flesh we are. We have a beginning, and one day our bodies will die, which tells us we have a limited time on the earth to accomplish things and make an impact. Not only are we mortal, we're also vulnerable to sickness, injury, various kinds of breakdowns. And we also need rest, right? Humans have to sleep. I was listening to a great podcast earlier today on the human pursuit of running a sub-four-minute mile. The guy who finally ran the first ever four-minute mile was a junior medical doctor named Roger Bannister from the United Kingdom who would actually go on to become a neurologist and scientist who studied the autonomic nervous system. When Bannister was pursuing becoming the first human to run a sub-four-minute mile, he studied the human body like a scientist would, and its performance capabilities finally concluded it, that it was possible for a highly trained athlete to run at near maximum effort for only about six minutes before they would just absolutely collapse and all systems would shut down and they would basically pass out. Maybe today's athletes have surpassed that figure, I don't know, but the fact is that we finite humans can you know, literally try our best, as it were, for only a period of about six or seven minutes or so, and then everything shuts down. We are not designed to go at 100% of our maximum capability for very long. We can't go without sleep, water, rest, or a break for very long. In other words, we're finite, and we have a finite amount of time to accomplish things, and this means that we're not going to be able to do or accomplish everything that we, we want to do or accomplish with our lives. In other words, of all the things we want to do in our lives, we're probably not going to be able to do all of them. I hope that doesn't bum you out too much. Give an example. 
I'm a husband, a father of five kids, and a full-time pastor. That keeps life pretty busy. In addition, I love to write, and from... 2017 to 2019, I published a total of eight books. In 2020, right before the pandemic broke out, I began a daily Bible podcast, Sensing God's Call to Do That, and I did it for 731 straight days. You know how many books I wrote in those two years? zero. And that wasn't because I didn't want to, but because I really didn't have the time to do it. The point is quite simple. With limited resources, limited time, and a body that is limited by various weaknesses, we humans should be quite choosy about what we do with our time because, again, we can't do everything. Saying yes to one activity often means saying no to a different activity, and we humans who follow Jesus as Christians should be even more choosy with our time, right? Because he is going to call us to follow him and adopt his priorities as our own priorities. And that brings us to a massive question. What is the most important thing God wants us to do? Well, we could phrase that question in a bit more of a biblical way by asking, what is the single most important command in Scripture? Or simply, what are the most important commands in the Bible? Now, if you ask some Christians and some denominations that question, you're going to get some interesting answers. Have you guys seen the John 3.16 memes that have been throwing floating around lately on Instagram? Look, if you aren't into Christian memes online and you're missing out, let's poke a little lighthearted fun at ourselves shall we? I'm going to read a few of these memes. Basically, they take John 3.16 and then look at how various groups in Christianity might read it, slightly changing the text of John 3.16 to fit their own personal theology. For instance, how Catholics read John 3.16. For Mary so loved the world that she gave her only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. How about how evangelicals read John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever prays this prayer after me should not perish but have eternal life. How prosperity gospel people read John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not suffer but never have any problems. <laughs> I don't know about that. That sounds fake. How progressives read John 3.16. For God so loved the world that they, them, there gave they, them, their only child that whoever believes in they, them, there should not perish but have eternal life. Hmm, how about that? How Calvinists read John 3.16. For God so loved the elect that he gave his only son that the elect should not perish but have eternal life. Well, how about how Baptists read John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever is once saved will always be saved, even if they're unrepentant apostates. Ouch. Well, look, here's the point. The point is sometimes we trust scripture based on uh, the particular denomination or theological standpoint that we have. In a very similar way, you're going to have different Christians and groups that will answer our most important question, what's the most important command in the Bible? You're going to have groups answer that in different ways. Maybe if you ask a Methodist or a progressive Christian or a progressive church member what God's most important command is, they might say something like, feed the poor. And you know what? To be fair, that's pretty darn important. And it's commanded in the Bible. Ask a charismatic. They might say the most important thing is to speak in tongues. And I'm not going to say that's not important. Paul himself said he spoke in tongues, and he said don't forbid other people from speaking in tongues. But is it the most important thing? Of course not. Ask a Southern Baptist, which is, you know, me, what they might think is the most important thing in Scripture, and you're probably going to hear about the Great Commission as being the most important thing. You know what? That's pretty super important, right? Ask a Presbyterian. Maybe they're going to say something about having right theology or election or a high view of Scripture or something along those lines. And again, those are important things. But what does Jesus say? I'll wager 
You might know the answer to that question, but like me, you and I don't always live our lives in a way that lines up with the priorities of what Jesus says is the single most important and greatest command. And we read about that most important and greatest command in Matthew 22, 35. An expert in the law asked a question to test Jesus. Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? He said to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. So, Jesus, what's the single most important command? He says wholehearted love for God. That's it. That's number one. It's more important than the Great Commission, more important than feeding the poor. It's even more important than loving each other. And you know what? That's kind of mind-blowing, right? So I think you can imagine what a life devoted to the Great Commission as the single most important thing might look like. You know, it look like a missionary that gave up everything to take the gospel across the ocean to people that need to hear it. I think you can imagine what a life devoted to feeding the poor as the single most important command might look like. It maybe it would look like somebody who uh, starts a feeding ministry or a food pantry or, or, or carries food somehow some way to the poorest nations of the world. We can imagine what that looks like, but can you imagine what a life devoted to a wholehearted love for God as the single most important command looks like? It's a little harder to imagine, isn't it? Well, Good news. We have a wonderful example in Scripture, and that example is Mary of Bethany, again, one of my Bible heroes. We're going to hear about her in Luke 10, 38 through 42, which says this, While they were traveling, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. Oh, I love that passage of Scripture. Three things we need to see in that little passage from Luke 10. Number one, Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him. Martha, on the other hand, was distracted by her many tasks. And the, the Greek word there for distracted, it's the word paraspao. It means to be dragged around or drawn away. It's kind of a figure of speech, kind of like meaning you're drawn this way, then that way, this way, then that way. It's very distracting to flit around doing one task after another after another. Martha was distracted with much serving. Now, Scripture calls us to serve much and to help meet humanitarian needs in a practical way, but it's not the single most important thing. Martha was doing a, a very, very good thing. In fact, the Greek word there for serving, what she was doing, the thing that distracted Martha is the word we get deacon from. She was ministering. She was deaconing. She was doing a great thing, but not the greatest thing, not the highest priority. Mary, on the other hand, she was sitting at the feet of Jesus, loving him by listening to him. That was her priority. Now, on a related tangent, it is a truth that you and I, we become what we consume. Literally, spiritually, and emotionally, you and I are what we consume. Matthew 6, 22 through 23, Jesus says, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? In other words, what you and I let in to our mind through our eyes will either be very good for us or very bad for us. And the same goes for our ears, which is why in Mark 4.24, Jesus says, pay close attention or pay attention to what you hear. Along those lines, 
Have you heard of TikTok Ticks? No, I'm not an old person that's kind of butchering the name of a social network. If you don't know, TikTok is a video based social app that when you fire it up, it's basically going to feed you one video after another, after another, after another, dragging you around and distracting you from life. Some of the videos are pretty funny, right? Some are interesting, some are kind of heartbreaking and sad. I don't know, man, there's some weird stuff on TikTok. But since March of 2020, specialists and doctors and scientists in the United States of America, Australia, Canada, and the United Kingdom have seen a dramatic spike in young patients seeking treatment for ticks. This is according to the Wall Street Journal and quoted in TheVerge.com. Doctors say most of these young people watched content from TikTok creators who say they have Tourette's syndrome, which is a type of tick, T-I-C, disorder. Top TikTokers film themselves involuntarily cursing, slapping themselves, making click clapping sounds and things like that. And cumulatively, hashtag Tourette's videos have been viewed by people on TikTok more than 5 billion times. Now, that was an article that was about a year old. I'm guessing it's more than 10 billion times by now. Now, I want to encourage you, don't look up these videos because here's the thing. Tourette's syndrome is not contagious, but apparently people uh, watching people online who have tics, which are involuntary movements or words or sounds or spasms or something like that, watching that in people is contagious to a certain group of people because the majority of the dramatic spike in young patients coming into emergency rooms and hospitals and neurologists to get treatment for these ticks have been watching these Tourette's and other tick videos on TikTok. Something's going on. And whatever else that illustrates, it is a pretty good illustration of Matthew 6, 22 through 23. You become what you consume. You are influenced by what you watch and what you listen to. What you see and listen to has great impact on you. In fact, it can even scramble your brain somehow, some way, scientifically. If you and I listen to and watch good and godly things, it's like a good light in your body. Fill your body with garbage, on the other hand, through what your mouth says or what your ears hear or what your eyes see. And you and I, were going to be in trouble. Martha was dragged around and distracted, but Mary was filling her mind, filling her ears with good things because she was sitting at his feet and listening to him. And Jesus commended her for that. She was not an example of garbage in, garbage out. She was an example of light going in, light coming out. All right, so that's the first thing I want us to see. Second thing. Martha here has the boldness to kind of correct the Lord. She says to him in Luke 10, Don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. Well, look, again, serving is really important. Martha knows serving is important. Jesus has taught his disciples that the greatest among them will be a servant. Martha's modeling this, and Mary's just sitting there listening to Jesus. And Martha expects Mary to be scolded for this, but something surprising happens. Instead, Jesus gently instructs Martha and gives her a different perspective. Martha you're worried and upset about many things. That's important, the fact that she's worried and upset about many things. And keep that in the back of your mind. Martha's doing a good thing, actually a great thing. But Jesus sees into her with like beyond x-ray vision and sees that she's living a life of aggravation and irritation. She's task-oriented and accomplishing a lot. But why is she so worried and upset about so many things? We'll talk about that in a minute. Third thing we need to see in Luke 10, 38 through 42. Martha's worried about and upset about many things, but Mary, on the other hand, she's made a right choice. What choice did she make? 
I want you to hear these words because Luke 10, 42 is one of the single most profound teachings in the Bible. And it's short. Jesus says, one thing is necessary. Now let that sentence wash over you, remembering who it was that said it. One thing, one thing is necessary, says Jesus. But, but, but Jesus, what? One, only one thing is necessary? Now, what do you mean? All sorts of things are necessary, right? We're supposed to love each other. We're supposed to pray, right? We're supposed to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, take care of the poor. We're supposed to serve each other, right? Jesus, you taught us to wash each other's feet and, you know, share the gospel, all those kind of things. Aren't, aren't those important? Well, of course they are. But Jesus is telling Martha here and us that before any of those other good things, one thing is necessary. One thing is foundational. And you and I need to assess our lives today in light of these words of Jesus. Do we live in light of that one thing, that one necessary thing? Look, serving is not wrong. We need people to serve. Serving is the key to greatness, according to Jesus. Don't, be, don't strive to be a person of incredible power and wealth. Strive to be a servant. Martha was serving. And Jesus loved Martha, and Martha loved Jesus, and Martha was doing a good thing. So what was the problem? Well, here it is. Martha was serving disconnected from the heart of Jesus, and Mary was not. Mary was directly connected to the heart of Jesus, sitting at his feet, listening to his words. Serving was not the problem. Disconnection was the problem with Martha. Martha was disconnected from Jesus in that moment. Mary was not. You and I, we're not meant to be disconnected from Jesus. And we're going to see this really super clearly in Jesus' teaching of the vine and the branches in John 15, 1 through 8. Verse 4 says of John 15, Remain in me and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. Mary of Bethany was a living embodiment of that. She was plugged into Jesus. She was abiding. She was connected. She was remaining in Jesus. And Jesus commended her for that because it's the only way for you and I, Christian, to bear fruit, to be remaining or connected to Jesus. Martha was doing good things. She was serving, but she was disconnected from the power source of Jesus and his words and his spirit. One more peek into Mary of Bethany's life, and this happened during the week that Jesus died. I want you to think about it. Jesus knew that his death was upon him. He knew he was about to die. Think of, in his last week before his crucifixion, all of the people that Jesus could have invested in right before he died. You know, important people, rich people, people like Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea or Silas or Barnabas or Paul's family or Stephen the deacon's family. So, you know, all those kind of people that are going to become incredibly important in the church. And yet, Jesus went to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus's house to eat with them and stay with them and hang out with them. So please allow me to introduce this episode, this visit of Jesus with his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, with a Bible trivia question that normally would be hard if I said it outside of the context of this episode. Here's your question. Who in all of the Bible smelled the most like Jesus? I'll say it again, because it's weird, but it, there is an answer. Who in all of the Bible smelled the most like Jesus? And if you said Mary of Bethany, well, you nailed it. Let's read about it. John 12, 1 through 7. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. 
He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of what was put in it. Jesus answered, Leave her alone. She is kept it for the day of my burial, for you will always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Well, look, this is a big passage, and we need to see a few things here. One, one year's wages. Mary poured out her most precious earthly treasure all over Jesus, who was most certainly her greatest overall treasure, right? This perfume that she poured out in about a five or ten minute period may well have been the inheritance of Mary, her financial hope for the future, her savings account in modern parlance. It was probably worth the equivalent of about 50,000 American dollars now, which is, you know, one year's average wages in this century versus one year's average wages in the first century. And it's likely, even if she didn't sell that perfume, it should have lasted for years and years and years, maybe decades. Yet, Mary used it up in the space of a few minutes. And you know what? Back in the day, you don't have a lot of showers. You don't have indoor plumbing. Smelling good and perfume was really even more important by far than it is now. I imagine that after Mary poured out a whole pound of this stuff on Jesus and wiped him down with her hair, that she smelled like that perfume for weeks. And so did Jesus. Mary smelled the most like Jesus. Let me take that truth and shift into a bit of a metaphorical question. What do you smell like today? What do you smell like to other people? More specifically, what does your attitude smell like? You've probably heard somebody say to somebody else, hopefully not to you, your attitude stinks, right? We've all heard that before. Well, how does your attitude currently smell? If you are a Christian, do you smell like Jesus to your worldly friends or do you smell basically like them? Your activity and your personality is basically indistinguishable from them. Paul uses that metaphor of smell for to very powerful effect in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 through 16. He says, For to God we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved, and among those who are perishing. To some, we are an aroma of death leading to death, but to others, an aroma of life leading to life. Christians, we're to be the fragrance of Christ. And I think that few lost people in the Western world right now would say that Christians are living up to that standard e even remotely right now. Second thing we need to see in this passage, Mary was attacked and criticized. Unfortunately, all too often, we modern Christians, we can have stinky attitudes, a lot like the disciples in this passage. When Mary does this incredibly expensive and extravagant act of devotion for Jesus, the disciples, and it's not just Judas, according to Matthew 26, all the disciples complain about how Mary just blew a ton of money by anointing Jesus with her costly perfume. What a waste. Mary, on the other hand, she smelled like Jesus. The disciples appealed to serving the poor as their reason to criticize her extravagance, but and they appealed to a scriptural mandate to serve the needs of the poor. The thing about it is that many people who love and adore Jesus like Mary are going to receive criticism from others, from real believers who quote the scripture and who love Jesus, like, you know, Martha and the disciples. But the people who live a first commandment, first kind of lifestyle will often receive Christ criticism from saved and fruitful believers. The disciples, seeing what Mary did, were indignant. They were really angry. Often displays of love and God's call to focus on love for him and worship will stir up anger in even truly saved believers because we often value love too little and other things too much. Third thing to see. Consider Mary's investment. She blew what was almost certainly her life savings in like five or ten minutes. 
What a waste, the disciples said. But the real truth is, what an investment. She made this investment of pouring out this perfume on Jesus 2,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago, and it thunderstruck the creator of the world and the redeemer of mankind. Jesus said that what Mary of Bethany did for him will be forever remembered. And thus, here we are almost 2,000 years later, thousands of miles away from Bethany. At least I am. Maybe you're closer. And we're talking about her. For almost 2,000 years, Christians all around the globe have been discussing Mary of Bethany and her extravagant love for God. Why? Well, Mary captured the attention of the king of the universe, and according to him, she's going to be remembered forever. And it, all it cost her was a measly one year salary worth of perfume, perfume. And I would say, my friends, that this is the single greatest investment in the history of the entire world, and it's not even close. Others saw her as wasting her life, wasting her money, wasting her future, wasting her one bit of financial security, but Jesus, the King of Kings, saw it very differently. Mary lived her life in the greatest way possible. When you look at the scripture, we know more about Mary of Bethany than all but a handful of the disciples and many other of the heroes of the Bible. What she has done in love for Jesus will be remembered. And I want to say something provocative, at least I hope it is. When we get to heaven, as Jesus mentions, there's going to be some in heaven who are first and some who are last. And you know what? It's going to be great for everybody. So don't worry too much if you're going to be last in heaven. It's better to be last in heaven than first on earth, surely. But And I'm not sure exactly how that first and last business works out, but I would bet all of my money on this. Every single pope that ever lived will be behind Mary of Bethany in the kingdom of heaven. Most pastors, most church leaders, most missionaries, and most famous Christian people will be also behind her in terms of that kind of first-last dynamic of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever Jesus meant when he mentioned being greatest in the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 18, 4, I believe that Mary of Bethany will be a shining example of that greatness in heaven, and she will outshine almost every other famous Christian you and I have ever heard of. One more thing from this passage. Mary understood what Jesus meant about his death, and this is a big deal. She likely understood what was about to happen to Jesus when the disciples were still mostly clueless. At least three times, Jesus told his disciples he was going to Jerusalem to die. I want us to look at how these uh, sometimes meat-headed disciples responded when Jesus said these things. For instance, the first time, Matthew 16, 21 through 23, says from then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes be killed and be raised on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh no, Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned and told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Second time, Jesus told his disciples, Mark 9, 30-34, They left that place and made their way through Galilee, but he did not want anyone to know it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after he's killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent because on the way they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. One more, Matthew 20, 17 through 21, third time Jesus told the disciples he was going to die. While going up to Jerusalem, Jesus took the 12 disciples aside privately and said to them on the way, See, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified, and on the third day he will be raised. 
Then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with her son. She knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want? He asked her. Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and the other on your left, in your kingdom. Do you see that? Three times here, Jesus tells the disciples that he's going to be crucified. The first time he tells them, Peter rebukes him and corrects him. That's pretty brassy, Peter, to try and correct Jesus, right? The second time, the disciples don't really understand, so instead of trying to understand, they get into an argument about which one of them was the most awesome. Now, oh, head-shaking emoji. The third time, James and John's mom picks this as the best time to come and ask Jesus for a special favor so that her two precious little boys will be the most exalted when Jesus comes soon to his full power. Wow, can you believe these people? It looks like, at least on the surface, they have no compassion for Jesus. Mary of Bethany, on the other hand, somehow, some way, she gets it. She prepares Jesus for what he's about to face. And let me restate that so you can understand the hugeness of what I'm saying. Jesus is a few days away when Mary anoints him from facing the most horrible trial any being has ever faced in history. What he is about to go through is so utterly horrifying and catastrophically terrible that Jesus prays literal drops of blood out of his face when he thinks about facing the cross and paying the penalty for my sin and your sin. Of all the human beings on the entire earth at the time that Jesus is about, is about to go through this, only one that we know of does something to comfort Jesus and prepare him for the cross. One single person. Now, I guess you could argue that Peter tried to comfort Jesus when he told him, even if everyone else abandoned you, Master, I never will. But the thing about what Peter says, and I love Peter, he's one of my favorites, but what he said there, it was a lie. Peter ran away like everybody else when Jesus was arrested. Mary alone, of all of the friends, companions, and disciples of Jesus, tried to minister to him before he died. How could she have known to do this? How could she see where literally everybody else failed to see? I submit to you that Mary saw what was happening and Mary alone ministered to Jesus, probably because Mary lived a lifestyle of loving Jesus and was extravagantly devoted to him. She listened to him. Over and above anything else, she put the first commandment first. And when we put the first commandment first, like Mary did, that has a tendency to sharpen our vision and enable us to discern the real priorities of life. Well, December of last year, 2021, I was driving our kids to church and all of a sudden our van lost power pulled off of the road and nothing could be done. It was dead. We had it towed in and initially it appeared that the engine completely went kaput because it was empty of oil. Now at the time there was no uh, light on or anything like that. I don't know what happened, but we assumed for a couple of months that maybe a leak happened and we just didn't notice, but it actually turns out that the head gasket exploded and we were without a vehicle for months while we looked for a replacement engine. This was in the middle of Omicron and it was really difficult to order this kind of stuff. Like we tried three different engines and it didn't work. Well, a lovely, wonderful family in our church, the Lowe family, loaned us their vehicle in an act of just incredible kindness. And that vehicle was awesome. It was big. It was roomy. It was fun to drive. It was manly. The only thing wrong with that vehicle is that people who wear glasses like me and have astigmatism couldn't see the fuel level light on a bright and sunny day. But that wasn't a big problem for us because I didn't know you couldn't see that fuel level light for one. And for two, I almost never drove that vehicle. I drove my little blue car. One day, however, we switched up and I drove our daughter Cassidy to a school thing driving that vehicle. I dropped her off in Monterey and then pulled out and made it about a hundred feet down the road and that car suddenly died. I gotta tell you, I was mortified. I was so bummed out. I thought I had killed our friend's car and that somehow I was just 
cursed, right? I'd killed two vehicles in the space of like a couple of months. Well, it actually turns out that the vehicle just ran out of gas. And spoiler alert, a life hack, cars need gas. And I didn't see the light on it. I didn't notice it. And to be fair to me, and I don't know if this is fair, too, too fair. I mean, I should have known, but that's the first time that has happened to me in decades. Well, cars need gas. Cars can't run without gas. Christians, on the other hand, we need connection to Jesus. We cannot serve without it. Martha was trying to serve without connection to Jesus. And hear me, it made her irritable. It made her angry. It made her judgy, anxious, worried. She was serving from a dry place. Friend, Serving without connection to Jesus will do that very same thing for us. Irritability in serving, anger in serving, being judgmental in serving, being anxious in serving, being worried in serving or in ministry, those things are all warning lights that you and I, we're about out of fuel. We're about on empty, which our fuel is connection to Jesus. The disciples were irritable too, and occasionally clueless. They didn't get it because they didn't get connection to Jesus yet, but Mary of Bethany did. I want to run, once more remind you of John 15, verse 4, where Jesus says, Remain in me, and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. Jesus says that one thing is necessary. We've seen today that the one thing Jesus was talking about was a life that focuses on listening and loving Jesus. So how do we respond? How can we live like Mary of Bethany? Well, we have to be a people of that same one thing. And again, that one thing that we see in Mary of Bethany's life, that one thing that's necessary, according to Jesus, is a great commandment lifestyle that prioritizes loving God and loving Jesus. It prioritizes our relationship with him. It prioritizes sitting at his feet and listening to his word. It prioritizes abiding, connecting, being fueled by Jesus. John 7, 37 through 39, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, says, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. He said this about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. You and I, dear friend, dear brother, dear sister, we're like Christian cars, and Jesus and his words and his Spirit are our fuel. The one thing necessary for you and I to minister and serve and live is for you and I to continually come to Jesus and drink that living water. Apart from him, we can do nothing and we need it constantly. And I love how old school evangelist Dwight Moody, D.L. Moody, reminds us of how we need that living water from Jesus constantly. He says this, we see the Holy Spirit come on the disciples powerfully in Acts chapter 2. And if you turn to Acts chapter 4, you will find that the Holy Spirit came a second time and at a place where they were so that the earth was shaken and they were filled with his power. This means, says Moody, we are leaky vessels. We have to keep right under the fountain all the time to keep full of Christ and so have a fresh supply. I believe this is a mistake a great many of us are making. We are trying to do God's work with the grace God gave us 10 years ago. Now, what we need is a fresh supply, a fresh anointing, fresh power. And if we seek it and seek it with all our hearts, we will obtain it. In Acts 19, says Moody, we read of 12 men at Ephesus who, when the inquiry was made, if they had received the Holy Spirit, when they believed, they answered, we haven't even heard whether there be a Holy Spirit. I venture to say that there are many in the church now who, if you were to ask them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed, they would reply, 
Uh, I don't know what you mean by that. I firmly believe that the church has just laid this knowledge aside, mislaid it somewhere, and so Christians are without power. When I was out in California, says Moody, I was surprised to find on one farm that everything all around it was green, all the trees and flowers, everything was blooming, and everything was green and beautiful, and just across the hedge, everything was dried up. There wasn't a green thing over there. I couldn't understand it, so I asked about it, and I found that the man that had everything green on his land, he irrigated. He just poured the water right on, and that kept everything green while the fields that were next to his were as dry as Gideon's fleece without a drop of dew. And so it is with a great many in the church today. They are like these farms in California, dreary desert, everything parched and desolate, and apparently no life in them. They can sit next to a man who is full of the Spirit of God, who is like a green tree, and who is bringing forth fruit, and yet they will not seek a similar blessing. Well, says Moody, why this difference? Well, because God has poured water on him that was thirsty. That's the difference. One has been seeking this anointing and he has received it. And when we want this above everything else, God will surely give it to us. The great question before us now is, do we want it? Well, friends, are you thirsty? Are you tired of serving on an empty tank? Are you irritable, judgy? angry, fussing, weary, anxious, worried, distracted, it's time to come to the well and drink. Jesus is the well. Revelation twenty two seventeen is a great verse to close on. It says, both the spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. Dear friends, that water is free. That water is the words and the spirit and the presence and connection with Jesus. Apart from it, you can do nothing. So go after him now and get that living water because I know you're thirsty for it. Good day to you and Godspeed.